So it's a huge privilege um, to be here. This is my favorite um, meeting of the year, not just because I can find all of you, which is really important to me, but it really does a very good job of highlighting the excellence in research and researchers that are in the Bay Area. And as um, somebody from the East Coast, I also really appreciate that you consider Davis the Bay Area. <laughs> More from my street cred and things like that. Um, so in terms of my objectives for today, in addition to talking with you about a very interesting association between a raccoon polyomavirus and, um, and a brain tumor in raccoons, um, I think it's a very important objective that I have to talk about the importance of looking at spontaneous and natural disease in animals that are non-experimental animals. And this is what uh, we do as a, as, as a really important goal of our job in veterinary medicine. And I think that looking at spontaneous disease does an enormous amount in terms of educating us about the plasticity and the wonder um, that is the potential of the virus world. And so the example I've chosen today, I hope will highlight that. That's the goal that I have. And um, you did ask me to give a little bit of an introduction. And so I'll couch that in my job at Davis, where um, along with the other um, anatomic pathologists who are there at the vet school, we have, um, we have a job, um, a tripartite job, which includes um, doing about 3,000 necropsies or biopsies per year at our hospital um, in diagnostics. And we share that as a faculty load we have, a, um, we have animals that come in anywhere from small and large animals, which are the biggest um, part of our, of our uh, cohort, but also a lot of other places as well. And I have a particular interest in intensively housed animals in animal shelters. We uh, support a residency program, and one of the very, very important things about Davis is that not only do we have the veterinary school and a really active research primate center, but we also have a medical school all on the same campus. And so the robust clinical trials program relies on, on, on having um, all of that, and our research relies on having all of that. We all have a really important load in teaching, which is mostly the veterinary students, 550 of them at any given time on the floor. Um, uh, or uh, in the four years, graduate groups that span um, departments and residency training and a lot of pony clubs that trot through on the weekends. So in terms of introducing myself, um, I was an undergraduate um, at Swarthmore College and a major in Latin American politics and um, biology. And when I got out of school, George Bush was not hiring anyone who was studying the woman's role in the political movement against Pinochet in the southern cone of South America. <laughs> and so I was a uh, ultimate frisbee bum and a cook for two years before I entered graduate school at Harvard in the laboratory of Larry Goldstein, who worked on cytoskeletal-associated proteins, is now a Howard Hughes Fellow at San Diego, um, and Larry did a really good job of helping cure me of what I call RAD, which is research um, attention deficit disorder, um, and taught me how to focus on an answerable question and to ask an answerable question. And um, I uh, started a, or I, I completed a postdoc at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute on cerebral malaria and was thereafter completely addicted to the study of infectious diseases. And I did that by entering veterinary school first for a medical education in comparative medicine and comparative pathology and entered my faculty position from there. So no street cred, you did not hear virology in any of that. <laughs> so animal disease surveillance in California is similar to most of the rest of the US. The thing that I want to point out that's super unique about veterinary medicine that um, human medicine um, um, does not do is the fact that we have four animal disease diagnostic labs and the Red Star, which is Davis as well, that in concert um, do perform about 20,000 necropsies per year on animals. Um, and, and that animal surveillance provides us with a tissue pool and uh, a, an eye on spontaneous disease and unencumbered by medicine, et cetera, disease that I think is very, very unique to what viruses can do um, in an animal. And so much of that is driven, as you might imagine, um, and supported certainly financially by, uh, by the um, possibility that some of these diseases can jump into humans. 
It's also supported by the fact that we want to keep our food chain safe, our agricultural chain safe, and also a part of those animals are looking at wildlife and our domestic animals, individual animal health. And that's a case that I'm going to talk with you about um, today. The opportunities for me in this job that I have are unbelievably deep and unbelievably exciting. Um, the first opportunity that came my way as a young faculty at Davis was by way of a phone call from Eric Delwart, who um, is at UCSF and the Blood Systems Research Institute. And Eric uh, recognized that I worked with animal shelters and also recognized that animal intensively housed, stressed out cats in animal shelters are God's gift to emerging viruses. And um, <laughs> being a virus hunter, he um, asked, we started a collaboration that's been incredibly fruitful about trying to find um, viruses. And he and his research collaborator, Lin Lin Lee, who's pictured here as well, um, are um, part of the story that I'm talking about today. My role in viral discovery is not in viral discovery, but in recognizing in the tissues a canonical reaction to uh, insult that might be caused by a virus. And I hand those over unceremoniously, or we use a degenerate primer strategy as well in my lab to um, do viral discovery. And then I come in again at the end of things where we want to put that virus back into the animal and ask whether or not it is causing the disease that we saw, or whether or not we can look in a retrospective or a prospective set of animals about whether or not that virus is contributing to uh, um, animal disease. So the last part of the opportunities comes when we have delved more deeply, and we've delved um, pretty deeply at this point, about three years of study into the raccoon polyoma virus and its association with brain tumors. And that's brought me into collaborations that have been really um, exciting with uh, real um, uh, um, uh, neuropathologists and virologists. This is Dr. Kevin Wollard, who's at UC Davis, and Dr. Chris Buck, who's at the NIH. And then, of course, Eric um, and Lin Lin as virologist. And this has been, as I said, very, very fruitful. So we do continue to look for new viruses. Um, this is actually Eric talking at the third annual Bay Area Virology meeting, where he's talking about pressing out all the boundaries of what we currently know of our, our viruses and different virus families. And I actually hold him personally responsible for whenever I'm in taxonomic hell um, when we discover a new virus. So what are the challenging things that we study in human and experimental models? We could talk about this endlessly. It's a fascinating thing. And a lot of people today have thought very, very hard about how they're doing their experiments and what they're doing their experiments. And mostly, I'm going to focus on um, the things that we're uh, really focusing on in my lab, because it's where our expertise lies, which is that we can look at things like the natural history of the virus in the animal. We can look at tissue tropisms. And this one is super important to me, cogent protein protein associations. And I have down here a paper by Jaeger and a large group at UCSF, some of the authors are in this audience right now, that did an elegant experiment where they expressed all of the HIV proteins, and they expressed those proteins um, and looked at their interactions with host cellular proteins, and then they mapped the complete landscape genome association of all those proteins with um, uh, the cytoplasmic proteins of a host cell. And the interesting thing to me is they did that in two different cell types. They did that in jerkit cells and 293T cells. And their conclusion and part of their validation was that 200 of these proteins overlapped, 200 out of 500 overlapped, and were similar in both those cells. And my conclusion from that paper was, holy crap, 300 proteins did not overlap between those two cells, which means that we have to think very carefully, as the last speaker and several today did, about which cells we choose to study our viruses in. They have to be relevant tissue targets, and those protein-protein associations are then cogent. So this is uh, preaching to the choir. You guys understand that viruses can contribute to, um, to uh, uh, cancer. And this is a, uh, a pie chart of the contribution to human cancer. As you've heard a little bit about the herpes today, and there's a poster, a couple posters on papilloma out there, the human papilloma virus and its association with cervical and oral cancers. I want to point out that these are the viruses, the viral, the, the, this is viral oncogenesis that we accept is causal. In other words, these tumors are addicted 
to the oncogene, the viral oncogene that causes this and are carried through stably throughout the history of that tumor and, and causality is proven. It's very, very hard one proof to reach here. I think it's probably the case that viruses by their exquisite way of being able to manipulate the cell cycle and multiple proteins in the cell cycle and their exquisite way of being able to induce chronic inflammation probably contribute to cancer in a stepwise manner in a lot of times where we don't recognize. But these are the ones that we do recognize. How do viruses contribute to spontaneous cancer and free-ranging and domestic animals? We haven't the foggiest idea. I do not mean to put down the fact that the animal viral oncogenesis has a, re a really deep and rich history, Rouse sarcoma virus, bovine papilloma virus. This is how we built this knowledge. But in terms of spontaneous cancers in animals, we really don't understand. I'm much more interested in whether or not that dynamic between the virus and emergence of cancer is changing. And I do think that the interface with animals is changing a lot, a whole lot in the history of our world. So for example, our intensive agriculture and our intensive feeding mechanisms and um, our interface with animals, for example, pet animals has changed very recently. And both pet and wildlife populations, either by design or by narrowing wildlife habitat, we've created clones of animals with very, very little genetic diversity and how that how that causes their susceptibility or how that changes their susceptibility is a really interesting question. So cheetahs, for example, are considered a completely clonal population at this point worldwide. So um, in terms of cancer and wildlife, um, the, uh, we have an environment where the human-animal interface is becoming more and more broad, and raccoons are not in any danger of becoming endangered. They are not. Unfortunately, I can't pull any of that grant money, um, but they certainly are intimately associated with humans, um, and so uh, they're, they're part of this. If you asked me 10 years ago, are animals becoming extinct because of cancer, I would have said no. That's not true at all. In the last 10 years, um, that, has become, um, that has become an issue with multiple species of our animals, where cancer is the principal driving problem with loss of those populations to the threat of extinction in many cases at this point. So I want to introduce the players um, here. Um, Dr. F uh, Florente de la Cruz is a technician in my laboratory, and he, is, um, he was an undergrad at Davis when I pulled him into the laboratory, and he is now our, our go-to person for molecular biology and for um, bioinformatics. He's a, r a really amazing resource, and it's, he is the discoverer of raccoon polyomavirus, and it's his work with uh, Teresa Brostoff, who's a veterinary student and a PhD student, and Dr. Molly Church. Um, who I'm talking, and this is, I'm talking about their work and my collaborator at Davis, Kevin Woolard, today principally. And Stephen Kubiski gets left out of the mix because he's studying a different circular DNA virus called circovirus in dogs. A super interesting story. So here's our, here's our main player, the raccoon. Very, very su successful in the face of humans. In fact, more successful than less in the face of humans. And so population studies in suburbia say that about 55 of them can, be, can live in a, in a square block. And that is sustained because of us. Um, they do very, very well with humans. And they share that place with a lot of other mesopredators, as we call them, or mid-predators, that many of which are in the same family of carnivores as the raccoon is, like the fox, the red fox, dogs, cats, badgers, um, and then other animals like opossum, skunks, rats, etc. And they share all the same food. They share all the same water supply. They share all of our um, structures, etc. there. So about three years ago, uh, Dr. Leslie Woods and Federico Giannini at the diagnostic lab, which is next door to our diagnostic lab, um, in three months saw three raccoons that had brain tumors in their olfactory tracts. And that gave them um, some surprise. Raccoons are short-lived animals. Cancer is not often described in raccoons, very rarely described in raccoons. And they had three in the brain in the same place all at once. So um, that gave, they, we talked at that point, at uh, the point that there were three, we thought that there was sort of a temporal outbreak of, of these brain tumors. And we were able to ask across the country, raccoons are necropsied quite a bit, especially in New England because they carry rabies. And so we do neurologic necropsies on hundreds of raccoons every year. 
and no one had ever seen anything like this before in a raccoon. So you can imagine Eric's um, and my excitement about the possibility that that might be associated with a virus in this region. And at the time, we looked at the spectrum of viruses that are considered oncogenic. Again, you've heard about some of these today. Um, and we considered um, a strategy in order to try to see if any of these viruses were associated. And in particular, at the time, I was focused on um, herpes virus, the beta herpes virus, and polyoma virus from information that if you uh, told me to design something right now, I don't even believe. But naively speaking, it worked out very well for us because using a degenerate primer strategy and seven different portions of the polyoma virus genome, we pulled out a fragment of a polyoma virus from one of the raccoon brain tumors. And we went about um, sequencing the entire virus from that fragment, and it, is, it looks like many other polyoma viruses. Um, the the uh, sort of the archetype virus that you uh, know the best is going to be SBV40, uh, I would imagine. It's five kilobase. It has a non-coding region, and it drives either these so-called early genes this early gene, which is a single non-structural protein in polyoma virus, the single one that is the, called the tumor antigen or large tumor antigen, and it encodes everything that is necessary and is, is individually sufficient for transformation in culture, for example, the large T antigen. So this is a really complicated Swiss Army knife of a protein, this one here. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then the structural proteins on the other um, half of the genome. So the viral capsid proteins on the other half of the genome. Just very, very briefly, the first polyomavirus ever discovered was mouse polyomavirus. And it was called that because when it was injected in neonatal mice, it made all sorts of types of tumors everywhere in the body of the mouse. And then in probably the most exciting um, un unplanned epidemiologic experiment of the century, um, we inoculated 100 million Americans um, with a contaminated polio virus vaccine because all of those vaccines had in them a primate polyoma virus called SV40. We know that SV40 can cause tumors in laboratory animals. So you can imagine that all the research that was done subsequent to that discovery and all of these people now in, um, infected or at least exposed to SV40 produced an enormous amount of information about polyoma virus, the cell cycle, um, and the relationship of LT with retinoblastoma, P53, all of those things were discovered because of research on polyoma virus. It has a very rich history. So given what I know now about how much polyoma virus can do with cell cycle ma machinery, the question that I come across um, with um, from everything we've done in my lab is why the heck are we not walking tumors all the time? We carry papillomaviruses, polyomaviruses, you know, dozens of them on our skin daily. We're infected when we're young. We carry them till we're old. So I find this a very, very fascinating question. Raccoon polyoma virus phylogenetically is linked to um, uh, a lot of other primate polyoma viruses and several that are known to be oncogenic, including Merkel cell polyoma virus, which causes a skin cancer in humans. This is a picture of what the tumor is. So here's a normal raccoon brain here with a cerebellum and the brainstem cerebrum olfactory bulb right here and nasal cavity nosed here. This piece right here that is not recognizable in the upper picture is a, is a tumor that's extended and pushed back on the brainstem and pushed forward into the sinus and nasal cavity. So this is the canonical place where we discover these viruses. And to bring you up to date, um, we had, as of um, yesterday, 20 olfactory lobe tumors, which represented 12% of the necropsied population of raccoons um, that we did in the diagnostic lab and at the VMTH, which is a remarkable number, even though this is a skewed, rescued population. Uh, raccoon polyoma virus is found in 100% of those tumors, in every single tumor, and it's not just found in those tumors, it's found in huge quantities in those tumors. We're talking CTs between 12 and 17 in every tumor. So it's really, really abundant. Viral load in those tumors is very high, or genome is very high. And one of the early things we found out is that when we had a raccoon that had metastasis of the brain tumor, and this is a liver of a raccoon, and this is a metastasis right here, so a clonal population of those tumor cells in the liver, and this is an in situ hybridization showing expression of that large T non-structural tumor antigen. Five minutes, really? So, 
Um, my whole lab left uh, an hour ago, not because they anticipated that I was going to embarrass them, which they did, but, <laughs> but because we just got a call from Mill Valley that there's another uh, likely raccoon tumor suspect. We have a really good relationship with, uh, with uh, Marin and what they find. And in the very most important statistics I can give you um, uh, on, on raccoons, is that the likelihood that a raccoon will die or be euthanized on a Friday afternoon and that our entire weekend <laughs> will be devoted, wholly devoted to um, culturing cell lines and processing tissues and doing all of that work is very significant. <laughs> so the first question that's gonna come to your mind with the history that I've told you is what if the virus is only in California? Oh, Dr. Molly Church, this is, and, and, and all the other human polyomaviruses are very prevalent in the human population everywhere, even though disease is very rare. The raccoon polyomavirus is present across the US. As far as we know, we've looked at some 500 serum samples, and Molly Church designed a beautiful ELISA assay to that VP1 protein. And what we know is that raccoon polyomavirus is not just in California, it's across the United States. The range of exposure is, is kind of exciting, um, but we haven't found any significance so far with what we're seeing in terms of disease in the raccoons. So let's get back to that question of why they're all here. And this comes with um, understanding that we did a heroic job of taking a lot of markers trying to define what type of tumor this was. And you know that tumor cells don't behave well. So we got a lot of very enigmatic answers when we looked at this. We got tumors that looked like glioblastoma or neural tumors and tumors that looked like peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And in a sweep of kismet that I will always be happy about, Dr. Woolard came and joined our faculty when I was giving a talk on raccoon polyomavirus. And he had been studying this exciting stream of stem cells that come from the subventricular zone, zone, travel along the rostral migratory stream, and populate our olfactory tract. All of the astrocytes, all of the neurons throughout our lives are turning over about every two weeks and dividing in this tract. And this is what he studied when he was at the NCI before he came to us at Davis. He studied it in dogs, but it's what he studied. So he quickly took this stream of cells from the rostral migratory tract out of a raccoon. And what you can see up here is he's shown that using either um, these cells that he's isolated from a normal raccoon or cells that he's isolated from a tumor, that these cells express stem cell markers, the nestin and the SOX. Both of these cells express stem cell markers. And moreover, he can drive them into neural or glial lineage. So he's identified the target cell of infection very exciting for us. Really good work with him and Dr. Church. So I'll leave you with the three parts of where we are in terms of trying to decide whether a raccoon polyomavirus is causative for brain tumors. And this is the most important one, I think, is that in transcriptome analyses of different tumors, we see a huge expression of large T antigen. And I'll show you this represented in a different way. That's this orange relief map over here on the left. That is present in the face of the fact that VPs are not expressed in these tumors. Now in Merkel cell polyomavirus and in papillomavirus associated cervical cancer, that's because integration disrupts expression of the structural proteins. And that's part of the drive for tumorigenesis. And that is not the case with raccoon polyomavirus. Whether we look at our tumors or primary cell lines or even xenograft cells from these tumors, this virus is episomal. It's stably maintained as an episome right throughout. So that's an exciting difference. And this is just another representation of how abundant TAG is compared to the structural proteins. We don't know is the answer to that question, how VPs are, being rep are, are either being repressed or TAG is being upregulated. So uh, I told you that we have a, a NOD-SKID model now of um, brain tumors in mice. And that's Dr. Brostoff up there. And all of our mouse, uh, mice in the original experiment that we did within a couple months uh, succumbed um, to a brain tumor, uh, lost weight, and succumbed. And those tumors in the mice recapitulate very well, either by their morphology or their expression of that tumor antigen, the mothership. So here's our mouse. 
and here is the LT expression, and here's that in the raccoon. So that's an exciting thing we have. And regardless of whether we look at tumors or cell lines or xenografts, LT is heavily expressed. And that's part of the story of the fact that, um, that, this, the, that this is contributing to tumorigenesis. Um, VP, we don't know yet. Just as a last sideline of what's going on, when we get out of the raccoon, where we do not find any virions at all, in the raccoon we have never ever visualized virions and VP expression is very low. As soon as we get into a dish, we start seeing virions being produced. And so we have a way now of isolating the virus and studying the virus and infection. And in fact, Molly Church is doing that based on her studies with the virus distribution in raccoons that do not have tumors we're taking uh, kidney epithelial cells, for example, and we're doing primary cell cultures. This is a kidney H&E, and this is again that um, looking at LT expression in tubular epithelial cells. This is a region of persistence, one of a few regions of persistence that we have. And she's now cultured renal tubular primary epithelial cells and the neural glial cells, and she'll look at the difference in behavior of, those vi of that virus in those different cell lines. And that's, you'll be happy to know since you got the end up. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions, but I'm going to have to uh, FaceTime my lab if you ask anything really intelligent. So questions. Yeah. Um. What was the, were the stem cells in the, were those stem cells in the hepatocytes in the liver or were those hepatocytes? So the, what you were looking at was uh, a nest of metastatic tumor within the liver. So it hadn't infected the liver, but it was a metastasis from the brain tumor that had gotten into the liver and that expressed LT. But they were the neuroglial stem cells that were in the liver, yes. Um, have you ever uh, used the virions to actually try to induce one of these cancers? And the reason I ask is because there's a few examples where, granted that this tumor may be induced by a virus, there's a few examples of, uh, of, virus, of cancers that are actually transmissible across HLA incompatible sure. animals, devils, dogs. Uh, you mean like a clonal cancer like the Tasmanian devil story? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? So we did look uh, with microRNA to show that each of these tumors had individually arisen in each of the individual raccoons. But we haven't done what you said, which is to infect a raccoon and try to see if they develop the cancer. No. Have not done that with a raccoon. Yeah. Hi. Um, could you speculate on the origin of the, uh, of the virus, please? So this is a really, really important question, especially to those like uh, Delwart and Buck who are interested in phylogenetics and things like that. Polyoma viruses have been with us since out of Africa. And so one of the insightful things that that brings up is the fact that when polyoma viruses jump species, for example, when we put SV40 into a mouse, tumorigenesis can occur because of that jump, because the barriers to that virus that it's been living with for so long um, are no longer there. And so one of the things that we speculate is that the raccoon virus is relatively recently introduced into the raccoon. I have no idea how to prove that. And if you have ideas, that is why I'm here. So. Have at it, everyone. It's a really interesting question, and we are looking in relatives of the carnivores for polyoma viruses that they're caring to ask. And we did stand outside of a, well, actually, we got all the right regulate, re regulatory uh, paperwork for it. We did get a whole bunch of pee from pregnant women to ask if they were shedding raccoon polyoma virus, because that would have been grants for sure. And we failed. We looked at 50 <laughs> pregnant women pee, and there was no polyoma virus there. There was no raccoon polyoma virus there. Any other questions? Yeah. Does it encode a middle T antigen? That's a good question. So there is something that is a like a middle T antigen that, w that by transcriptome analysis that is predicted that we call 57 KT. Um, and so it's possible. We don't have a protein profile yet. We just got our monoclonal to LT up and running. So we don't have the protein profile to ask which of those LTs are actually being translated, which are the ones that are actually acting in the cells. But it, it's very important when we're comparing it to the murine.